two girls, one podcast, and their unsolicited opinions. Plug in your headphones or find a private space because this content is not safe for work. Welcome to On Her Bookshelf. Hi, I'm Julia. Hi, I'm Christy. Welcome back to On Her Bookshelf. Today, we are deep diving into the world of Entangled by Rebecca Quinn. Uh, so this is book two in the Bristlebrook series. But before we get started, if you haven't read the first book, which is Ensnared, head on over to episode six. Uh, we chat all about it in that one because today's episode with Entangled is going to be deep diving into all the spoilers. Yes. And quick heads up, there are some triggers and content warnings. So please please be mindful of that um as we delve into this book obviously we're going to discuss some topics yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'll put a link in the description um check that out. sounds easy yeah <laughs> that sounds easy just check your trigger warnings yes. <laughs> so what did you rate it Ooh, love starting with this five stars obviously five stars you same oh <laughs> If I could rate higher, I would. I feel like that's a silly question of course, if I start for you. I feel like Becky Quinn very quickly became one of your new favourite authors. Literally, she's in my top three. She knows this. She's on a pedestal right now. She's never coming down, okay? She could do her no wrong unless she kills all the brutes. Then I'm just, like, rioting. Oh, okay, look. Slight thing before we like deep dive into this. Obviously, because we do follow Rebecca Quinn on Instagram, she puts up all these stories and posts about the brutes and one of them had bow and then like a skull and crossbones and I thought that I was like spoiling myself that he was going to die at the end of this. I'm very thankful all the brutes are still alive. <laughs> I know I was traumatized because I saw this before I was even like halfway through the book and I was like what is going to Thank happen? you how could you? <laughs> like, I was gaslighting myself at this stage. Yeah, okay, <laughs> but what did you rate it for spice? Oh. Are we doing like spicy peppers? Is it a five out of five kind of? You tell me. You know like, what? Is it a hot tamale or is it like a fucking <laughs> ghost pepper? Five out of five for spice. Like, yep. hands down, amazing. I thought she nailed it in book one. I was like, how will ever she up the ante? But of course she knows how to up the ante. Of course. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The spice was just something else. And something I do like about smart authors is especially when each scene is different from the last like nothing feels repetitive yeah. i yeah. i agree with that let me just say from someone who listened to the audiobook oh boy <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna lie i only have audible so that i could listen to becky quinn's books I don't think I can actually switch back to regular audiobooks now that just have one narrator yeah. because we were spoiled for a full cast. Oh, yeah, we were. <laughs> so I I have since deleted Audible, but only after I used my remaining credit to get entangled. <laughs> because there are some scenes that I just I need to listen to. Two words, bubble bath. Yes. <laughs> when we'll get into that That's soon. Enough. No, you just need to read the book if you want to know more. <laughs> oh no context, just bubble bath. Where do we even begin? <laughs> let's actually get into the book. Okay, Where do okay. we begin? How about a recap? Yeah, let's <laughs> how did How did book one end? So we know that Eden has been taken by Sam. Uh, Lucky's been shot. <laughs> Jake's missing. <laughs> Literally, Russellbrook is in chaos. <laughs> um, Rebecca Quinn... Becky, my girl, this woman is an absolute master of bringing us to the edge and then hitting us with a wave of emotions because the cliffhanger that she left us on in book one, that wasn't fair. That was not fair. Becky, please. She's definitely a sadist. <laughs> Hands down. So, Entangled, we pick up in Eden's point of view. Let me tell you, it is a roller coaster of emotions, okay? <laughs> She's hurt. She's being dragged along by Sam. She's numb after days of traveling. Uh, she has no clue what awaits her. The emotional depth and raw intensity of this moment, this scene had me weeping. Like the first time I read this, I had tears in my eyes. Mm -hmm. At this point, we don't know who's alive, who's dead. Anxiety. That's all I have to say. Anxiety. <laughs> like, it seriously just seems so dire when we started this book. 
and like the twists just keep on coming. So Sam drags her back to the camp of chaos. We are now like meeting new characters like Mateo and Alistar. Uh, we have learnt that half of the camp actually follows Sam and half follows Alistar, which is already an interesting dynamic yeah. to quite a volatile situation. Um, a lot of these men are hurt. They are nursing wounds. Like some guys lost an arm. It's really yeah. wild. But <laughs> these are the men that are the remaining survivors from the attack on Bristlebrook. Alistair's all burnt up. It's questionable if he's actually going to live or die at this stage. Mateo is obviously head over heels in yeah, love with obviously. them, which I thought was a nice little addition there. Yeah, like what's going to happen next? We're here for a bit, like a, a bit of like the MM romances. Yeah. We also meet Aaron and Akira. Mm. Important. Remember this. Surprise, surprise. We also learn that Sam and his followers are. Mm, they think women should only be under men's control uh, they want to go back to the old times when uh, women would serve men be at their feet at their beck and call you know and sam makes this happen at cyanide he is confining these women it's it's a terrifying reality just to even think that it's just basically sam is a piece of shit <laughs> that's that really easier to sum up <laughs> we hate him <laughs> um, this is also when heartbreaking eden is told that her boots are dead. When she broke, so did I. I felt for her. I really felt for her. I lay down in the dirt, fetal position, like cried with this girl. I sobbed. I felt everything. But this is also when we meet Madison and we get the most heartfelt moment. This is also when I already knew I would love her. Like I would love this character. Madison holds Eden's hand while they're getting beaten. These these women are getting beaten for simply not being quiet. These women are survivors. They're literally trauma bonding right now. So, like book one, book two is also told from multiple point of views. Mm -hmm. And I adored Rebecca Quinn for this for book one. Normally when there's like a story being told with multiple perspectives, it can sometimes be a little bit hard to follow and it feels like the story can jump around. Yeah. Not the case at all. Entangled is still told from six different perspectives. So Eden and her five brutes. And honestly, it enhances the story. And Rebecca Quinn is an absolute... She's been a master in being able to just really pinpoint each character's individual voice. Yeah. And like I said, it just enhances the story tenfold. So we actually at this stage flick back to the boys. We've got uh, Jasper, Jake and Dom. They're the ones that have been tasked with the rescue mission and have been basically tracking whatever traces of Sam and Eden that they can follow. Uh, at this stage, like, they're each dealing with their own inner conflicts, guilt, and obviously they are desperate to bring Eden home. Uh, we also learn that Lucky is alive and Dr. Bo. <laughs> it's, it's, I can't. <laughs> Dr. Bo, mom. So, it's also around this scene as well that Jake finds out that Eden actually broke the deal that she had with the brutes yeah. so he ends up flicking back into his i guess grumpy headspace that eden doesn't want him anymore like she she's left she's him. left him like she's broken out of the deal just so that she can go be with like Bo and lucky and like my heart hurts for him because this guy doesn't realize how much eden like loves him and I very, very quickly became a Jake girl throughout this book. <laughs> I, I loved him in book one, but he's got a place in my heart. The character development for him in book two <gasps> is phenomenal. And some of these like character di dynamics that we are going to get in with like these new people we're introduced to, I'm clapping. <laughs> so looking back to the camp mm -hmm. Eden and Madison they're tied up together they're tra trauma bonding <laughs> trauma bonding <laughs> they're holding each other and talking about their boys that they lost and you know crying obviously trauma <laughs> this scene also broke me twice because I read it twice because I'm a fucking idiot uh, <laughs> and then you listen to the audiobook as well <laughs> yeah like three times <laughs> am I a masochist 
I mean, you could be a Jake girl. <laughs> You're definitely a Jake girl. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I felt all of the emotions that Eden was feeling. I ate for Madison. Um, that's right, because she's mourning Tommy. Yeah, we find out she lost her person. And that Alistair killed him. Fucking asshole. And, and look, okay. I don't know about you, but it was in this moment that I started to actually question who Madison was. I was a little bit suspicious hearing her description as she's like described with red hair. And then she mentioned that her boyfriend was Tommy. And I'm like, oh, these are all really familiar things. But I don't remember a Madison from book one. And I swear, like, I was being gaslit by Becky because I was just like, I'm not crazy, right? I haven't forgotten, like, a key character's name because I distinctly remember there being arguments between Dom and Bo and some redheaded chick that ran off with a Thomas. But I'm like, Madison? Who's Madison? That's not her name. And I'm like, and I wouldn't be like, Becky wouldn't just forget a character's name either. I was, okay, I was a little bit confused, but I'm like, there's more to this. There is more to this. And I'm like, just keep reading. Don't try and go back to book one and like scroll through my Kindle trying to search out this girl's name because I couldn't remember at this stage. But I, all I knew is that it wasn't Madison, but this character sounds like whoever the hell Dom and Bo like had a falling out over. But also... <laughs> In this moment, we get a beautiful line from Madison where her and Eden are bonding and they go, what do you want to talk about? And I think it's Eden that says something like plotting. Plotting murder or something. Yeah, like. like to avenge my brutal. Yeah. And uh, Madison's basically just like, murder is one of my favorite topics. And I was like, I love her. Same I don't girl. care who she is, but I am rooting for her yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> No, some of the lines that Madison comes through with the whole book, really, is just, she's fucking brilliant. I love her. She's one of my new favourite characters. I've already said that. Just. But. Mm -hmm. Tangent time. All right. <laughs> it's gonna, is this a new thing? I don't know. I, don't know. Um, I feel like I need to be, like, strapping myself in. Yes. <laughs> Getting my cork water string ready to discuss <laughs> like whatever Charlie. theory you want to go on. <laughs> we need to discuss Eden. Uh-huh. Okay, so, Eden is my favourite. She is a true survivor. She has weathered the apocalypse since day death. Literally on her own for four years. And she's just found the brutes. She's just found that family. And it's now been snatched away from her. She's captured to Sam and his men. She doesn't know what her future looks like. She believes her brutes are dead. Literally worst case scenario. But Eden is not just strong. She is resourceful. Throughout the series, Eden deals with self-doubt, you know, viewing herself as neither strong nor brave, but more of a coward. We hear that a lot throughout, especially this book. But her intelligence is remarkable. She might not have the physical strength, mm, right? Yeah. But she's been able to think her way through the direst of circumstances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And <sighs> honest, honestly, we, we love a girl with a brain. That's <laughs> some hot girl energy right there. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Eating Krauss's plan to dismantle Sam's men. She's dismantle? It sounds like she's like <laughs> disembodied. Then we're going like, back to like Butcher and Blackbird. We're just going to slice <laughs> some body parts, eh? Hey? Oh my god. To she's going to take them out. That's she's, what, yeah, she's going to take them out. Body. Okay? She's plotting. <laughs> she ends up volunteering to cook gradually earning the trust of her captors that's it she's playing the that servant mind mindset that oh i'm supposed i'm one of you now yeah, i need to like woman. show my worth i guess all i can do is cook for you i'm oh, just a silly man. old woman <laughs> but she plays it really well because yeah. she gained their trust so easily and so quickly mm -hmm. and she at the camp because they stayed at this camp for quite a few days before they decided to keep traveling to cyanide and she essentially got herself into a position where she just became somebody in the background yeah brilliant pay no attention it's, it's fucking brilliant big brain energy <laughs> yes 
and she kind of clicks that she's got a she's still got a vial of water hemlock in her pocket from book one. That's right. That was such a little like I was like Becky, you you you, you know what? Of everything. When she when she put it in her pocket in book one, I was I was ready for it to come into play in book one. So yeah. I had forgotten about it by the time I was reading book two. Uh, I was like, there it is. <laughs> but um. Yeah, she just patiently bides her time, essentially, waiting for the right moment to unleash the deadly water hemlock. And then we get this line. This is one of my favourite lines in this book. I killed your herd. Fear the fury of a woman who has nothing to motherfucking lose. I love it. And for, for me, it's not very often that I feel like I can hear music while I'm reading, but I swear in that moment and after delivering that line, as she's walking through the camp of people literally dying around her, I was like, this is a bad bitch. <laughs> BBE energy. <laughs> <laughs> while Eden is wreaking havoc across the camp, her brutes, they're, they're still searching for her. And they soon discover that they've actually been following the, the wrong tracks. I I broke. I, that, that broke me. Because here I was thinking, fuck, they're never going to catch up to her at this stage. They've been following her for days, only to now realise that they're not even following the right people. But, 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 we meet Bentley. I love Bentley. Bentley wielding a sword. Muscular Bentley, who all I can picture is him in a, a knight's outfit <laughs> in the forest. Like, Bentley bringing a sword to a gunfight, Bentley. But <laughs> his, like, his bravery, you can just, like, read it through the pages. The only way I feel like I can describe Bentley is literally the knight in shining armor who will do whatever he can to rescue the damsel or get the medicine for the child. And that's essentially why he is out in the forest. So we actually learn in this moment that Bentley is the leader of the red zone. And later in the book, we learn, we also learn that the kid he's trying to get inhalers for is his um, nephew. Yeah, his nephew who's got severe asthma. Um, so He's out in the forest trying to raid the camp because he knows the sinners are out and about as well and is under the impression that the sinners camp has medicine. So Bentley and like his little posse <laughs> that he's traveling with end up teaming up with the brutes to form a plan where they, you know, they strike a deal together that let's all work together, get rid of the sinners. The brutes can rescue Eden and Bentley can walk away with whatever medicine that they find. Great deal, right? It's essentially fuck shit up, get the girl in the medicine. <laughs> Sums it up beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, now we flip back to Eden and Madison. They are on the run because, well, the camp is literally dying around them. But there are still a few people that either didn't have the soup that Eden poisoned or don't find themselves getting as sick as quickly as some of the others that the water hemlock has taken effect on. Mm. So whoever's remaining from this camp is basically in pursuit of like Eden and Madison. Because these women are their prize to take back to Cyanide and the remaining sinners at the camp. And if they lose them, well, they lost half their men trying to attack Bristlebrook and have so far come back empty handed because apparently they had knowledge that there was meant to be families of women and children there, mm -hmm. which is why they targeted Bristlebrook in the first place. But they're about to lose Madison and Eden as well. So they are chasing them because they do not want these two women to get away. Madison, however, is she's injured. So it's, it's incredibly difficult for her to flee. And we actually, we have a really interesting moment of dialogue between these two characters where they both want to help the other one get away from their captors. But Madison comes to the conclusion that, that she's too injured and is just slowing Eden down. Like she knows that Eden has a chance to escape 
if Eden would just leave her behind. And Eden doesn't want to leave her behind. She has this kind of inner conflict between staying with Madison or running for her own survival. And she actually decides to leave Madison and, and run. Like you read through Eden's warring thoughts between the two options and you just kind of like feel the disappointment in her character. Like as a reader I was actually disappointed in Eden's choice but I feel like it's also going to like at this stage highlight a lot of the character growth that Eden's going to go on through this book. Yeah. Um, because she does have quite a few moments later on where she's trying to overcome this what's the word that I'm looking for? Like cowardice. That's yeah. how she views herself. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, even though Eden has taken a few steps away from Madison, it's it's looking like she is gonna leave her there. We we then get this line where it's it's beautiful. And Eden says it is better to die with a friend than to live a thousand lives alone. And that's when she kind of, <laughs> I know, and that's when she decides, you know what, I am going to turn around. I'm not going to leave Madison alone. And then we get these lines. A chorus of feminine voices roar back, a storm of Valkyries, and Madison laughs, reinforcements. She whoops back to one of the calls, the cavalry's here. Who run the world? Girls. <laughs> Honestly, the female empowerment I felt in this scene, brilliant. While these absolute fearless fucking queens slay their enemies, <laughs> this boy, the boys stumble onto this. Like, they don't need no man. That's right, because this is where the brutes actually end up catching up. Like, they find the camp, they go, oh, what the fuck? There's all these dead bodies. What's yeah. happening here? Eden must be dead. Yeah. And then they hear the chaos and commotion happening up ahead and run into, like, literally a bunch of women absolutely owning. <laughs> literally, yeah. like, it was just fucking brilliant. Yeah, so it's the coolest little fight scene between all these Valkyries and then the brutes, like, stumble upon and they think they're the helping but the girls didn't really need them mm -mm. jake ends up getting like choked out by is it some old old biddy <laughs> like i think so like <laughs> oh he gets choked out by sloan i think do, do, doesn't matter the girls are literally they don't need they've no got man. it covered and once they figure out they are all actually on the same side madison is the one that goes whoa like yeah. hold up We've killed all the sinners. Let's stop fighting and just time out. Yeah. <laughs> they literally call this time out. It's, honestly, it's it's a great it's a great fight scene. There's not many fight scenes that leave me going, holy fuck. Not just with anxiety, but a little bit like giggly as well. Yeah. And I feel like that that was it. Because again, like the brutes have just stumbled upon people fighting in the forest, not with guns, but with bows and arrows and wire and it's just oh, it's and those... primitive and it's brilliant slingshots <laughs> yeah, yes slingshot. yes and they're just like um <laughs> jump forward they're all kind of like trying to figure out what's going on i guess and we get the moment where eden sees that her men are alive well at least three of them um and then kind of figure out what she did because they didn't they didn't think that she could do that that she could fucking unleash havoc onto this camp of sinners. Remember how she freaked out in book one over just killing a guy? Yeah. <laughs> just killing a guy rough. rough. Um, <laughs> rough. But she killed a whole camp, essentially. Like, and it was 16 people. Yeah. Uh, some Something. It was just a lot of people, okay? It, it's a big deal for Eden, the little librarian, essentially. That's what Dom thinks of her, you know? But then we also find out. Madison gave away intel to Sam. She's the one that sold out Bristlebrook. And that Madison is actually Heather. Called it. Heather Fucking that broke Dom's heart, called Heather. Called it. Called it. And you know what? There is also an initial moment where Eden and Madison slash Heather are talking in the beginning. And Madison's just like, oh, but what if I tell you something? What if I confess something? You're like, you'll still like me. I'm like, she was the one that ratted it out. Yeah, but she's going to say she something. She was the one. And 
then that's it and, and Eden's just like it doesn't matter like yeah. I'll be your friend no matter what like I could never judge you and I'm like mm. oh I I just didn't see I didn't see it I I thought that's a bit strange I had like warning bells but I didn't think it was Heather mm. Fucking brilliant, Becky. Brilliant. Well done. It was well done. <laughs> Essentially, after that bombshell of a discovery, Ina goes into a fit of rage. She fucking attacks Madison, Heather. I don't Heather, know. Heather, Madison. Yeah. Understandable. She, she think it's Like, literally, this woman is the reason why her men could have died. Yeah. And that could be dead. She doesn't know about Lucky and Bob at this That's moment right. either. Like, she is freaking the fuck out. She is melting down obviously she has gone through a really traumatic experience and jasper tries to talk her down from the panic and she brushes it off yeah it's just like jasper is trying to do his like psychologist over analysis of uh what are my five steps to bring her out of this panic and i'm like okay it's really cute that you're trying but this is not what she needs right now yeah, room time, bro. Mm. But it just felt as if, you know, Jasper's heart was in the right place. He he really wanted to bring Eden home, but the last conversation between Eden and Jasper just was left on such, like, a sour, sour yeah. note because Eden wanted him, but Jasper put in boundaries, like, no, you know, our kinks aren't going to line up. We can just be friends and it really had an impact on the trust that Eden could put into Jasper even though Jasper is a psychologist it just put her in a position where she couldn't talk to him she couldn't trust him in those vulnerable moments so from here uh, Heather actually ends up leading everyone back to their secret bat cave headquarters. <laughs> uh, and look, the setup is actually really impressive considering they don't have the same level of resources like Bristlebrook, mm. but it is nothing compared to Bristlebrook. They're in a cave. Yeah. There's water dripping from the cave. It's it's a cave. Yeah. These people have been surviving in a cave. And like, no shit to the caves, because obviously Eden survived in a cave for four years. Yeah. But we read a whole book where we had the amenities and facilities and life at Bristlebrook. I feel like a very easy flow for the brutes to suggest, well, you guys can't stay here anymore. We did absolutely nothing to cover our tracks from where the fight was back to this cave. This place is compromised. People from like Cyanide, the Sinners, they're going to come looking for revenge because that's the type of people that you are. And there was hundreds hundreds of women and children in this area they were like you're a target and now they know where you are yeah so they offer to let all these civilians follow them back to bristlebrook and i had some concerns about how this dynamic was going to work i got very comfortable with it just being eden and her brutes i didn't know how you know the essentially a new polyamorous relationship was going to work. Yeah. I didn't know how it was going to continue because even now there was already some conflicts forming amongst her and the guys. And I don't know, I just had a lot of questions towards the world building and how this was going to play out, especially even just with sleeping situations at yeah. the house. <laughs> yeah, like I yeah, that too. I feel like Bristlebrook's a little bit on like more of the mansion side of things, but I'm like a hundred people, a hundred people. I'm like, where the fuck are they all sleeping? And then I was like, is all these women are they going to start getting in the way and trying to go after all these new men because girl, they are hot. Mm. Yeah, you can't blame them. <laughs> I want to blame them. Essentially, on the way back to Bristlebrook. It's really hard to say, okay? Oh, no. Dom and Eden are... we just... They're major fucking goofballs, they're idiots. They're... They both struggle to kind of admit their feelings and they opt to just remain friends. I hated that. <laughs> I was like, you guys both want each other. Just fucking get your bang on, man! <laughs> but then we also get the cutest fucking shit with Jakey Goo. I'm going to read this. You're a sucker for I, I am. I'm a sucker <laughs> for him. Because some of the things that come out of his mouth in this book, I'm just... All right. Give us the quote. Give us okay, the quote. The quote is, 
Do I say it like him? No. <laughs> Okay. Wanna, look, it's one thing for you to start imitating <laughs> Bo. <laughs> Maybe we leave the accents just okay. there. <laughs> you want to hide away from every piece of shit out there instead of fighting. Then I'll build you a damn fortress. You need a monster to protect you from the monsters. Then I'll do the dirty work. My hands are already filthy with it. But if you want to learn how to rip out their throats yourself, sugar, then I'll show you how to fucking buy it. <laughs> oh, we also find out that Eden didn't click that... Lucky and Jasper have been pining over each other for years. Oh, How did she not pick up on that? I know, right? But she's <laughs> she's essentially just, just like, I'll back off, Lucky. You go get your man, stop being a fucking idiot. And I'm like, honey, why choose? This is a why choose. Why are you choosing? <laughs> Honestly. Look, I hate a miscommunication trope, but I also feel like it wasn't heavy with it i felt like it was just natural for the characters to have these conflicts as they're trying to navigate a new relationship with yeah. five, five six it, people yeah it's fair enough I guess. there was going to be i guess some ups and downs especially amongst people that don't always share yeah yeah true yeah, yeah i get it so yeah bristol Brook. oh now who can't see it <laughs> <laughs> so yes bristol So yes, Bristlebrook is full of miscommunication. We have Jake and Eden as well who also decide to call it quits because he thinks that she is choosing between like him and Bo and choosing Bo over him because they're always choosing Bo over him. And you know, Eden's just and things with Lucky as well, so he can be with Jasper and she's not getting in the way between them. And then on top of that, like Dom and Bo are also fighting because Bo believes now that Heather is back Dom's gonna want to be with her instead of Eden and I'm like Bo maybe stop and pause for a minute because Tommy has just died and this girl was in love with him why is she gonna jump back on Dom when things ended so sourly between them I don't know it just seemed he's it got, just seemed petty he's got a chip on his shoulder yeah he needs to work through that so the whole situation's messy and <sighs> On top of this, the argument between the characters was witnessed by everyone who actually ended up going on to despise Eden for what they thought was her turning her back on Jake straight away. It took them, what, like five days to travel back to Bristol, Bristol yeah, Brook? something like that. And like each of these days, it has been Eden and Jake sneaking off to be with one another. So as soon as they get back to Bristlebrook, Eden's all over these other guys and they just assume it's Eden being disloyal towards Jake. Jake, who was out in the forest, her saviour, and she ditches him as soon as she's back at Bristlebrook. But like these civilians that have just come there as well, they obviously don't know the dynamic that was in place and the deal that was in place and the relationship between all of these characters might I add I am going to jump forward a little bit here when the relationship between Eden and the Brutes is explained they're just like so accepting of it yeah they go oh so she's just with all of them oh this was agreed to it and they go Jake you're the one being the asshole I loved it I loved how quickly it went from Eden's a bitch to, oh, fuck, we're the ones who are being dicks to her. Yeah. I loved it. Becky, well done. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Flick it back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I jumped. I jumped it's just fine. a little bit. It's so fine. <laughs> we get our Mr. Dr. Bo. Dr. Beaumont. Dr. Beaumont Bennett. <sighs> Asking Eden, how bad a darling? <laughs> you ready to go steady with me? <laughs> Bless his little southern heart. He's a sweetheart, but he knows it as well. Oh, he knows Milks it. Milks that accent. Oh. And we're here for it. Yes. <laughs> Special mention, though, to chapter 32 <laughs> in the audiobook. You don't know, but um, 38 minutes of hot Dr. Bo brought to life. Rebecca Quinn is out here unlocking all of the kings if you haven't already the audio is just the hottest not safe for work i've ever heard 
You're welcome. <laughs> So not only do we have that brilliant moment with Dr. Bo. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's something that you are missing from the Dr. Bo scene that I was like, <gasps> for. So when they start doing this role play, Dr. Bo is like, oh, my assistant isn't available. You don't mind if I just hit play on this recorder for us? And I'm like, audio porn. <laughs> They're recording audio porn. <laughs> Set me. <laughs> I just oh. laugh so hard my <laughs> But yes, I agree. I hired down the There are so many parts of that scene um, that sent me. <gasps> Becky. Becky. <laughs> I don't even know how to go on from that, but we also get Jasper confessing his love to Lucian and I wanted to cry. <laughs> like, how do I... I don't know how to say that after that moment. So just have that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but Lucky like comes and confronts Eden and is just like, how can you think it's possible for you to love multiple people just the same amount, but that I can't do the same? We're crazy complex people, Eden. Not everyone can be everything for something. But I'm like, it's it's such a true point though. Lucky is literally calling Eden a hypocrite in this moment yeah. because how is it okay for Eden to go on to love five guys but Lucky can't love her and Jasper? Yeah. It's... Bo, so why choose? It's, 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 <laughs> why choose? Why choose? <laughs> and then we get the good old Smutapalooza. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were <laughs> literally banging on about these chapters. I'm like, have you got to chapter 44 yet? Have you got to chapter 44? Tell me when you get to chapter Where 44. You when you get to chapter 44, just brace yourself. You're not going to want to put it down. Literally, chapter 44 to 48. It's a binge read. Becky. <laughs> Becky, 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 Becky. Becky delves into uh, the darker, more tantalizing aspects of BDSM kink. Let me tell you, these chapters were fucking hot. But the audio? <laughs> oh my god. I died. I went to heaven and then God turned me away because he read my book history. <laughs> I would not be allowed into heaven after this. Like, I have never read something so fucking hot. I learned things like so many kings unlocked. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Yeah. You're blushing. You're I blushing right now. I'm thinking going about it. red. That's it. Because <sighs> we finally get lucky and Eden bump in front. And do you remember that line? Um, oh, what's he say? I have to shove down hard on the voice insisting that anal annihilation is romantic. <laughs> Things that he thinks and says. This, that's why Lucky is my favorite. I'm sorry, but Lucky is my favorite. Look, okay, okay. But I have to point out as well: these chapters happen in the forest. They're yeah. just in the forest. Just fucking. The party is like not only like a couple like hundred meters or whatever away. Just fucking going They're at just, it. So of course, Jasper strolls on by. And that's where we get uh, this one fucking line <laughs> sent me. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't tended to her, Lucian. <laughs> Excuse me, Becky, I had heart palpitations. <laughs> and you think that's all Becky's got? <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Bo and his southern ass fucking strolls in too. And look, might I add, the book two still has the survival tips at the start of each chapter. Yeah. And we actually get this brilliant one which is survival tip number 263 two is company three is a crowd four is a party and you just know that this chapter is gonna be hot it's gonna <laughs> fucking slap now after this scene you're probably thinking that's it we can't take any more it's been fuck fest already <laughs> but becky loves to push us past our limits <laughs> but it's okay because she taught us traffic lights <laughs> Eden then goes to Jake after getting dicked down in Dallas. 
And he just goes all caveman on our ass. I just, oh boy. <laughs> I love this man. I just love him. I think you're a little bit of a sucker for a primal too. Yeah. Because, yeah, he chases her through the woods. <laughs> Sailor ass. <laughs> So look, at this point, the only one left to fuck, I think, is Dom. Yeah. And Becky likes to tease us. Yeah. So Eden actually has this moment where she goes back to the party. She's so drunk and she bumps into Dom, thinking like she's going to have this big old heart to heart with him. Like, I've got things to tell you. And you just know that drunk Eden is ready to confess that she was the one that actually freed Alistair and Matteo. And Dom's like, come on, you're drunk. Let's get you some water. Let me carry you to bed. We're getting perspectives from Dom's inner thoughts as well. And he wants her. It's so obvious that he wants her. He wants that happily ever after. He wants that to happen with Bo and with Eden. He wants it to work out and like, you know, she be the one for the two of them. And then we get hit with fucking whiplash because Bo walks out of the bedroom covered in blood the room is full of blood you think holy fuck who has been murdered mm. turns out it's just been pig's blood that has been thrown around the entire room and what we learn is that akira is actually missing at this stage whoever's not wasted because right now i think lucky and eden have vomiting their guts up sharing like the same toilet bowl yeah. and everyone's kind of putting two and two together that Akira was in love with one of the men that Eden killed originally with like the bowl of soup and water hemlock and clearly wants revenge on Eden and Akira being missing probably means that she's gone back to cyanide gone back to the sinners she she has all this intel on Bristlebrook she was even a part of the team with Jake and Casey that ended up going and moving all the cameras around so she knows their locations again as well they've been compromised it's it's a huge fuck up and i don't know why it took so long for the brutes to come to this conclusion but they are army rangers why not sneak into cyanide fuck them up from the inside this is what they're good at this is what they were trained to do so they assemble a team and head to cyanide flash forward they end up in cyanide they meet up in Red Zone and uh, Eden and Dom have a moment. <laughs> Finally! And we get this line from Dom. He got rules. <laughs> okay! <laughs> rules one through five. Don't touch me unless I tell you to. Address me as sir. Stay where I put you. Don't speak unless you're moaning my fucking name. Answering a question or say for now. And when I ask for a hole to use, you better present one to me fast. All I can say is deceased. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but look, long plan short, they end up splitting into three teams to distract, defend, and infiltrate the Sinners HQ. Uh, Eden, Dom, and Madison end up on team Infiltrate, uh, sneaking through like uh, underground tunnels underneath the city. No surprise, they run into trouble. <laughs> and this time, Eden doesn't back down from a fight. She ends up saving Madison. She was brave. This character development. Chef's kiss, Becky. That's it. Like, we've, we've come full circle. She's no longer running away. She is here to defend her girl. Amazing. We loved it. And look, <laughs> while this is happening as well, uh, Lucky and Jasper on Team Distract have been tasked to set off explosions that mimic drone strikes. And already this feels like a bad idea because I've just said Lucky and explosions in the same sentence. <sighs> So Lucky thinks his team needs to bond and no better way to do this is to do a classic hazing. Uh, give the new guy the responsibility to hold the danger pack. And this guy is shitting himself. And of course, despite Jasper's warnings, it ends up going terribly wrong. And I quote probably one of my favorite lines well delivered in this book. It's Lucky saying, huh, the danger pack is on fire. <laughs> So, 
instead of controlled explosions, we actually get Lucky on the comms telling everyone to run like their life depends on it. This whole scene had me on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> things, are, things are going terribly wrong. The plan is out the window. We are running out of pages. <laughs> it's the worst. And then we flip back to Team Infiltrate being addressed by Alistar on the comms. Like, come up, drop your weapons, or your friends pay. Uh, Lucky, Jasper, Bo, and the rest of the team have been captured. The scene just... Holy fuck! And, and, and look, this is where I started to begin to question, like, how quickly they they lost control. Like, one minute there, everything seems to be going well, and yes, like, the explosions didn't go as planned, but that was really quick for them to get captured. Mm. And like, you know, how did Alice's men just seem to be in the right, right spot at the right time? Yeah. Yeah, I was a bit sus as well. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, Alice is healed. He's taken over Sam's team. He's the new leader. Um, and Aaron sold them fucking out, the little piece of shit. Mm -hmm. And they end up hanging Sam and his cultists in front of everyone. Yeah, that's it's it. It's fucking brutal. It was a, a big display of the power shift it was like sam all of his minions they're they're dead yeah so this is kind of where eden and alistair kind of have their little mind game mm. uh this like, was brilliant yeah he only wants to talk to her she's switched on really he just wants to talk to her because uh she set him free <laughs> um they know things yeah and it's exposed to the rest of the team that she set alistair and mateo free her betrayal is aired essentially mm -hmm. uh, madison is seething dom is in denial like she would never do that to us like it hurts so much but then it's like everything that eden was saying it just cements the fact that she kept this secret from them and yeah she went behind all of their backs yeah. against everyone's better nature to keep these people captive she was the one that ended up freeing him and she freed him she freed Alistair and Mateo under the assumption that Alistair was essentially a better devil than what Sam was. And in freeing Alistair, it would be the best chance that, I think it's like 137 women captive at the Sinner's headquarters in Cyanide had a, a better life, at survival, at getting free. Yeah. So that's what Eden believed Alistair's goal was. With the mind games, though, Eden ends up um, essentially playing long with what Alistair is saying to save her brutes. He pretends that she was his spy just so he doesn't kill them all and make an example of his new rule, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, this this moment is... It, it really highlights Eden's intelligence, being able to read the room and, like, not just talk herself um to survival but brutes and red zone and the rest of the teams that came to infiltrate the sinners she's managed to talk them out of being captives yeah uh they're able to get safe passage out of the situation return to bristlebrook return to red zone and you're just like okay everything seems to be be working but but no, it, no that can't be it's it. not that, easy. that seems too easy right there's there's got to be a pin to drop and Alistair is complex mm. and, and you know like I said before he agrees that you know Sam's ways were barbaric uh he's got a vision for a new world and it's at this stage during the conversation it seems to be one that we've been receiving mixed messages on because Eden at one stage says oh yeah you're gonna free the women right and then the men like Alistair's men witnessing this they start almost like about to outwardly riot like no like i'm not giving up my woman like i'm not giving up my right it's like these girls are prisoners mm. it's a really really tricky uh situation and especially with a shift in leadership as well like it's volatile right mm. now clearly the timing of their rescue mission is very much wrong place wrong time so alistair ends up coming to an agreement with Eden, um, he will let them go back to Bristlebrook, like, let them have their safe passage, 
if he can take two hostages and keep them under his rule. Mm. Obviously, Eden offers herself. Jasper has a moment where he tries to offer himself. The men riot. Like, her men. Her Bristlebrook men riot. They're you get this, like, thought of hers. I've never felt so loved before or so undeserving. That's it. Like, she has just outwardly betrayed their trust and still they're ready to sacrifice themselves for her. And fight for her. It's just... <sighs> but, no. It's not that simple. Alistair is calculating. And something that we didn't really openly talk about from the beginning but we actually learn back in some of the first scenes of the camp that Alistair has eyes for Madison you know Alice is like nope I don't want you Eden I want your leaders mm. I'm gonna keep Madison and Bentley as a sign of good faith and he essentially also asked for a like a tax as well like every month he's gonna come and either claim like food or or, or something it, yeah. it, it hasn't really gone into great depth the just yet right? yeah because of course this book ends on yet another cliffhanger becky becky i trusted you to get, i don't know give us something <laughs> and now i am eagerly awaiting book three to find out what happens next because i'm just in anxiety <laughs> yeah what she said <laughs> They're not in, they're not in a safe situation. Like this book just ends with conversation over. I'm taking these people with me. You guys owe me tax. The end. Yeah. We don't know if they get back to Bristlebrook. We don't know what's going to happen to Madison and Bentley, two of my favorite characters. Like. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So yeah. Thoughts. Thoughts on what do you think is going to happen in book three? Anxiety, anxiety, and more anxiety. Anxiety, stress, maybe some more hot sex scenes. Something oh, definitely. Haven't been delivered definitely. I, uh, <laughs> something whiplash. light. Okay, clearly. But something light, though. We are clearly going to have a moment between Dom and Bo. Dom, Bo, and Eden. We've only oh, please, had please. sprinkles of it so far. We need to have something between them. I also, I also want more... Eden, Lucky, and Jasper. Oh, yes. Yes, please. I want them both on their knees. Like, <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> so, I'm... I really want to know how Jacob... So, Jacob was left behind to look after Bristlebrook while everybody else went on this rescue mission. I'm really curious to find out what he has planned to be the leader because in some of these last few chapters when we do flick back to Jake's perspective amongst everything he comes to the realization that you know what I am going to start trying to be a better person than who they believe that I'm going to be like I'm going to be the leader that these civilians need right now while there's nobody else yeah. and you know I'm really curious to see where this goes yeah. I think book three is going to be the final one in this series uh -huh. And I guess some other things I'm questioning is she going to end up with all of them? Or yeah. is her relationship, say, with Jake, for example? I feel like that one's the most Tricky. on the fence right now because he struggles to share. You know, are they going to come together and he accepts this sharing situation or will they be, agree to be friends? So that's something oh, that... I, look, I want her to end up with all of them. Same. Like, I am rooting for it. Uh, I can't. You can't. You can't have the rest without Jacob. You just... It doesn't feel right. But also, I just want... I want Jake to be happy, you know? Yeah. Oh, Jakey poo. And something that, you know, keeps being brought up is, you know, when there is a misalignment of kinks, it can really impact a relationship. And yes, like, Eden's kinks to share and, like, have so much love to give to multiple people works for for her and Dom and Bo and Jasper and Lucky, Jake is primal. Like, he wants his woman to just be his woman. Things I also really want more of. So I want to know more of Benley. Mm -hmm. I want to know more of his backstory. I want to just more of his character. He's fucking funny. He is brilliant. He's a larrikin. He's... I just need more. Alistair. Mm -hmm. I want more on Alistair. I... Yeah. I'm confused with how things are playing out in 
like the Sinners headquarters mm. right now. I'm I'm really curious to see if he either just becomes Sam with the shift in power. You know, mm. is the power going to go to his head? Is he going to keep leaning into and become what Sam became? Yeah. Because he's just going to give the men what they want. Or is he going to change? Mm. Change the... It's it's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. And, and Rebecca Quinn is doing... I think she's doing a really great job at navigating such a controversial topic in her book as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, something lighter. I want more Ethel and Ida. Yeah. We didn't talk about them a lot. In We actually, I don't think we really did talk we about did. them at, at all, but I'm obsessed with these two characters. Yeah. They're essentially two older ladies. Are they in love or are they just friends? I don't know. I, you know what? It, it doesn't Support matter. no matter what. Ethel and Ida. Brilliant. Brilliant. They're so funny. Yeah. Same with Casey. Yes. Casey ends up being someone described to Jake as like a little sister yeah. figure. And I love the dynamic between her and Jake. I think she's going to play such an important role to Jake's character development. Definitely. Already have noticed a difference with her. So. Oh, like the girl, the girls group and the girls chat with Jake involved as well. I was here for yes. everything. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just... I just love all of the little characters. I That's it. And I it's, want more. it's something that Becky has done so well is the individual character voices and literally feeling each individual character as who they who they are. I didn't feel like there was any personalities that overlapped at all. I didn't get confused when I was, you know, reading different lines and going, Oh, who's saying this again? Mm. Becky's done a brilliant job in developing her characters and giving each of them individual voices. I will scream that from the hilltops. Yeah, no, hands down, I will <laughs> do the same. Five out of five stars. Highly recommend this book. We've been obsessed with the series since the beginning. Honestly, super excited to find out where the story is going to go in the third one. And the audiobook having a full cast of characters as well. Hands down, Rebecca Quinn is writing poetry at this stage. <laughs> it's just sex for my ears, honestly. I just... <laughs> I just want to say, like, a heartfelt thank you to <laughs> Becky. I just... Thank you for sharing your brilliance with the world. Um, just thank you. But please don't kill my brutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we trust you with our hearts right now. And book three needs to have some kind of happily ever after. Cause yeah. Otherwise, no more cliffhangers. Don't riot. leave it open. <laughs> there will be a riot. <laughs> Wrap it up Pitch nicely. And everything. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> but always, happy reading, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>